I explained the story to a, a couple weeks ago about my journey to understand iodine. And uh, I have someone that follows us. His first name is Denny. I won't give out his last name. But he's written to me with some really brilliant stuff that's kind of sent me down different pathways to explore. One was just making me aware of boron and how boron plays a critical role in calcium homeostasis, in bone health, um, arthritis, all these kinds of things. And we played the lecture by Jorge Fletcher. And that I believe is published. If not, I'm working on getting a bunch of stuff published this over the rest of the, the summer. So some of these videos will be out there. And I will be, for those of you who can't find it, I'll put my YouTube Bit shoot and rumble link on the website uh, today. We're revamping our website, so that's why we've seen some some changes there. But he just sent me something, and and John Campbell is a, a pharmacist that's become very popular during COVID, publishing a video every single day, and he has a million and a half followers or or so. But he he in this short section. Um, the answer is, is yes, we have a couple of websites, you know, that we're managing, which is not necessarily the best idea. At some point we'll merge them. But um, so Dr. Campbell kind of, you know, hits it, hits the nail right on the head. And let's just watch. Now you can hear the thunder and lightning in the background here because uh, we're getting a nice Tennessee storm. So um, with that being said, so the video, published by Dr. Campbell, and I do recommend you watch his channel, very good. Um, so some, some rampant version of, uh, of the coronavirus. Dr. Carter follows this stuff I don't. Um, I put my head in the sand and work on how we can make you resilient against it. Not that Dr. Carter doesn't, he obviously is the, the expert on our team on this, but I thought this video was um, particularly interesting. And so it kind of starts in the middle. Let me give you context. He's talking about the BA variant and that there was a fairly significant upswing in cases in Japan, surprisingly, but they also have very low mortality. And so he goes into explaining that. So let's just watch a couple minutes of this. The highest level of vigilance required by the Japanese government. A new wave of infections is BA5, of course, compared to the cases they've had there way up. Interestingly, in Japan, disproportionately affecting children and younger people. Now, Japan is interesting. There's something strange going on. They've had very low levels in Japan. Um, so, for example, in Japan, and this is just one of the thousands of things that are going to come out of this pandemic, uh, they eat a lot of seaweed. Um, I've been looking for seaweed in my supermarkets and can't find any. Uh, seaweed's very high in iodine. When you eat iodine regularly, that tops up the thyroid gland. It fills your thyroid gland up with this uh, iodine uh, storage or thyroxine storage molecule called thyroglobulin. Then when that's full, the iodine starts spilling out and goes into your blood. And you Michael, do you agree with that statement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. And, and the point I'm going to make here, I'll get, I'm going to reverse it and play that little piece again that's really important is that iodine 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 whatever we're gonna i call it iodine most recommendations on iodine rdas are all recommended daily allowances are always going to be low but in the functional community the the variation of recommendation goes from 150 micrograms to 100,000 micrograms Okay, it's a huge, huge variation. Why and what is it based on? What is the root cause uh, basis for the recommendation? And I think it's really important to understand that in some cases, the ones recommending very low levels are right. In some cases, the ones recommending high levels are kind of on the right track. I think their recommendations are, are too high. But Dr. Campbell here says that, you know, the thyroid is going to suck up some of that iodine. And then it's only when you have excess that it starts spilling over. Now it's never 100% the, the valve is turned off. There's always gonna be some spillage, but um, 
Let's go back and listen to Dr. Campbell one more time on this, but we didn't finish his little talk either. A new wave of infections is BA5, of course, compared to the cases they've had there, way up. Interestingly, in Japan, disproportionately affecting children and younger people. Now, Japan is interesting. There's something strange going on. They've had very low levels in Japan. Um, so, for example, in Japan, and this is just one of the thousands of things that are going to come out of this pandemic, uh, they eat a lot of seaweed. Um, I've been looking for seaweed in my supermarkets and can't find any. Uh, seaweed's very high in iodine. When you eat iodine regularly, that tops up the thyroid gland. It fills your thyroid gland up with this uh, iodine uh, storage or thyroxine storage molecule called thyroglobulin. Then when that's full, the iodine starts spilling out and goes into your blood. And if you've got free iodine in your blood, that iodine goes into your mucous membrane, your nose, your mouth, gastrointestinal tract. And Iodine kills all, let me say that again, all viruses. Iodine at sufficient concentrations will kill all viruses and all bacteria. So what we need to do is have a study where we look at people on high iodine diets like in Japan and analyze their mucus. This would be such a simple study to do. Why aren't Big Pharma doing it? I can't think. Um, all we need to do is, is, is take some saliva and some mucus from people in Japan from 1,000 people in Japan, uh, take some saliva and mucus from 1,000 people in England. You can have some of mine or the United States. Come and get mine anytime you want and compare the amounts of iodine in it and see if this theory is correct. Because if it is that there's more iodine in the mucus in Japan because they eat more seaweed contain more iodine, how simple would that be to massively reduce global morbidity and mortality from viral and bacterial diseases? Why is this research not being done? You can answer that question yourself. Now he's not. He used. He started out being very demure, and as the evidence piled up, he got more and more. Huh? That little uh, green um, thing is on my screen. I have no idea where that came from. Anyway, I thought that was on his, but very interesting. Well, anyway, we're not going to get rid of it. We'll have to uh, live through this distraction. But that that being the case. I've developed a protocol, Dr. Carter and I have, he, he, he sort of makes sense, thankfully, on how we optimize our iodine intake. And just as sort of a summary, for anybody who didn't hear this a couple of weeks ago, is about three Sundays ago, I felt like they're really, really flagging, not very energetic. And uh, I usually go out, I usually try to put about 100 miles on my bike on uh, you know, my pedal bike on the weekends, um, total in the summertime. And um, I only had like 60 miles on on Saturday. So I wanted to do 40 on Sunday, but I felt like crap, even at four o'clock in the afternoon. I popped 12 and a half milligrams. And I don't recommend anybody do this actually without proper testing. And two hours later, I went out and did 40 miles and I felt fantastic. And I've always, I'm always looking for rate limiting, you know. You produce CoQ10. We need to take CoQ10. Well, maybe when under physical exertion, you need to take CoQ10. It becomes limiting. Iodine, same thing. What does iodine drive? T3, your energy hormone. So it, it's it's really important. So let me just see if I can get rid of this crazy. That is the craziest thing anyway. How I turn my screen into a uh, a chalkboard, I have no idea. So here's the iodine protocol. Um, so most discussions about iodine revolve around Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You want to be careful on iodine intake. And Isabella Wentz, Pharma D, is the, the guru on this. And she's very clear. And as I've written this chapter, I'm going to publish this iodine um, section over the next couple of days on my blog. Yeah. But see, she has what I call selection bias, not by her own fault, but people who come to her generally have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So, but in, in reality, only one to 2% really have a, a true thyroid disease. However, you know, we've got to realize that iodine is a continuum. I mean, uh, uh, Hashimoto's is a continuum. Like, like anything else. Let me see, let me find my chart. I'm flipping around a little bit here. So where you are on the Hashimoto's thyroiditis continuum is going to somewhat dictate 
what you what is sort of a, an optimal or safe level for you. And um, so not that like throwing your thyroid into a tailspin if you have cancer or something like that is the worst thing in the world. But the point is, in most cases, Hashimoto's is measurable and reversible. And so anybody that has this condition should be working to mitigate it because the thyroid and Hashimoto's, it's really a canary for the autoimmune condition. And nobody wants to have that, that you know, that bubbling, you know, insidious uh, simmering condition going on in their body. So, so autoimmune disease is a condition in which your immune system mistakenly attacks your body. In most cases, there is a presumption that this just happens without some underlying pathology. Tom Blue, the, I'll, I'll pick on Tom. Uh, Michael doesn't mind if I pick on Tom Blue. We're not, <laughs> um, you know, uh, strategy officer for IFM. And he says, all diseases are autoimmune. It's like, no, I don't think so, Tom. If all diseases are autoimmune, we wouldn't survive as a species if our body would just suddenly turn on ourselves and, and attack it, attack ourselves. If this is the case, we'd not survive. In reality, there are very quantifiable causes behind autoimmune diseases. Um, intestinal permeability caused by H. pylori with references, parasite reference. I only give one reference of each. Incomplete digestion, food sensitivities, and then chronic, often stealth infections, bacterial diseases, including Lyme and periodontal infections viruses so once again we we have a a continuum so specific protocol for intake of optimal iodine above the rda and importantly above what is normally recommended in the functional community with the presumption of of hashimoto's if you don't have hashimoto's you can take higher levels should you well that's somewhat individual, but it's answered through testing. So here's my specific protocol, and I will publish this without the green little squiggles. Um, perform a complete evaluation of thyroid health. These are the biomarkers that must be obtained. Thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroxine, thyroxine, thyroxine thyronine, T3. I won't try to pronounce them this morning. Uh, free T3, but we need a little little guy there, uh, T4 direct, reverse T3. Dr. Carter, do you wanna spend a minute explaining what reverse T3 is? Well, I mean, it becomes like an inactive form of your thyroid hormone. So it's kind of like <clears throat> the body is telling you it's trying to uh, break uh, or slow your uh, you know, metabolic processes down. So uh, it's not a value that's uh, obtained by many traditional doctors, but it's an important one because, you know, TSH by itself is, is not very valuable in most instances. Even when, you know, it's even in the normal range, it still doesn't tell you anything because that, you know, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone coming from the pituitary, not from the thyroid. So you could have a lot of, you know, other processes going on, negative feedback, you know, mechanisms that you won't um, know uh, unless you measure all of the values, free T3, you know, free T4 total, T4 and T3, and, you know, the various, the thyroid peroxidase antibodies, thyroid globulin antibodies, uh, and reverse T3. And of course, on the other side, doing TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins for hyperthyroidism. So, so that's why it's really, really important to do a full panel um, to really kind of elucidate what's going on with the thyroid gland. Right. Thank you, Dr. Carter. And, and I've tested people that decided to have the full thyroid panel. Um, and um, I have seen significantly elevated antibodies against the thyroid with TSHs at 2.5. And you know Absolutely. that um, the standard of care lab course says 0.5 to around 4.5 is normal. Yet at 2.5, we're seeing antibodies. And so really, 
you know, if, if, if you want to be comfortable just with a TSH, you should be somewhere around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 to 1.5, no higher. And then you may be okay. And the only way we'll know for sure is to get more people to, to do the complete thyroid testing at that level. Yeah. But at 2.5, we've seen uh, Hashimoto. And it's, and it's really, really important to optimize thyroid levels, especially in you know, in the face of an infection. Um, so knowing those levels really, really important. And that's, you know, another reason, of course, why uh, Dr. Brownstein, um, well, of course, you know, he wrote the book on it. Um, so he's more biased toward it. However, um, it definitely makes sense adding the, uh, like the Lugol solution to the, um, the nebulized hydrogen peroxide because of its anti-infective um, capabilities. Absolutely. And a lot of people are deficient. So. So, so step one, you can see we're not just diving in and saying, take iodine. I think almost everybody's safe taking 150 micrograms MCG per day. And if you're not taking it supplemental, I can guarantee you, you're probably not getting that amount. Or if you are, Really, I think the number you want ultimately is around four to 500 from a daily dietary intake. So you wanna be taking in 150 micrograms. Even if you have Hashimoto's, you, need to have, you still need to have iodine. You can't suddenly like, I don't need iodine. Um, T4, four iodines. T3 is three iodines surrounding that molecule. So if there's no indication of Hashimoto's, then iodine intake above the RDA is recommended. The upper daily limit we recommend is three milligrams, so 3,000 micrograms as opposed to 150 micrograms. For perfectly healthy individuals on a whole food diet, 0.5 milligrams per day is probably out of place. So that's 500 um, micrograms. Athletes and those uh, who experience substantial daily stresses should double these recommendations. You lose iodine through urine, but you also lose iodine through sweat, okay? And so if you're very athletic and you want to have full energy, then you're probably gonna to wanna to be taking more iodine. Um, I met a gentleman two Saturdays ago who um, we do this group ride. It's a very fast one, 55 miles out of Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, I, I wound up on the second group chasing front group that were very, very fast. And when I finally got up to them, I found out that the gentleman who was driving the pace is 73 years old. And there were a bunch of young kids in that group as well, 73 years old. And then he told me he had Hashimoto's. So it's like, hmm, I wonder if he's taking iodine. How is he, how the heck is he doing that other than the fact that he's retired and he's doing 500 miles a week? But you do sweat out, you do sweat out the iodine. So so if there is an indication of Hashimoto's, test for and remediate causes, uh, even, with, uh, even people without Hashimoto's should consider this prior to increasing their current iodine intake. Some applicable, applicable tests include complete blood count with differential with an interpretation for low-grade viral or bacterial infection. And once again, um, you know, with the example for TSH with lab core, their numbers for normal are just incorrect. And the same with white blood cell counts. You gotta be looking at the minutia. You gotta be looking at those white blood cell counts with a fine tooth comb, with a magnifying glass. You should be right around 42 to 4,400 white blood cell total count with a neutrophil percent around 56 and a lymph lymphocyte around 45, 46 and a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio between 1.2 and 1.5. When that's the case, there's really no stealth infection going on in your body. That's how precise we need to get when it comes to this kind of thing. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. I want it to be less than three millimeters uh, settle of blood settle, uh, red blood cell settling in an hour in a test tube, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Anything above that infers internal inflammation and potentially malabsorption. I can't tell which, but um, oftentimes, I don't think anybody has a perfect microbiome. So if your ESR is above two, that's probably, it's probably a malabsorption syndrome. So seeing something like 
ferritin low, your iron storage, homocysteine elevated, things like that are good indicators that you're malabsorbing. And the set rate is being accurate on, on the, um, in terms of interpreting what's going on in terms of malabsorption syndrome. But H. pylori, um, so we have H. pylori, H. pylori causes stomach ulcers, it can contribute to intestinal permeability. So things that aren't properly digested can get through into the bloodstream and the thyroid can be a canary for those uh, 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 potentially as viewed by immune system offending um, proteins and other, other things. Um, oral pathogen tests, oral pathogens that may fester below the gum line may contribute to Hashimoto's. A stool test to determine microbiome health I'm not sure there's a perfect test out there, but getting a test like this is better than not getting a test. So, you know, Dave Osprey, uh, I have a blog out there from one of his videos. He said he had 160 unique organisms. In my opinion, that's adequate, but not often. Um, so even a guy like that, that's really focused on his health, probably could do an expansion of the diversity of his microbiome. Bravo yogurt has 300 by itself. Equilibrium probiotic has 115 unique strains. Um, fecal transplants, healthy poop, on average 500 strains. So diversity is the most important defense you have against all kinds of diseases and leaky gut syndrome. And then a food sensitivity test, and then work with a practitioner to get these tests and correct any issue uncovered. So step three, after appropriate protocols are completed, retest the steps, uh, retest the panel in step, hmm, in step one, oh, oh, panel in step two, so like the blood count. At a minimum, if these te tests are now optimal, retest the comprehensive thyroid panel. Um, adjust your iodine intake by measuring iodine levels and excretion. This is a serum test and a urine test, but um, uh, tests are somewhat imperfect because some iodine is lost to sweat. This is why athletes consider higher doses compared to sedentary people. So test for serum iodine, test for urine iodine, spot in 24 hour, adjust iodine intake, retest for iodine. Ideally, you should plot the iodine excretion level versus iodine intake. This type of chart will help you determine your physiological need. Now, now most of us aren't going to do that. So look, let's, let's make sure we don't have Hashimoto's. Let's make sure we have a, a good balance of TSH, T3, T4, and reverse T3 is in an optimal range indicating that we don't have inactive T3. And then you can probably up your, up your iodine. There are very few people I know that um, would do this kind of analysis, but I know Robert, I know you're out there. You would do that. I know you. Um, so I have some people that are very fastidious about you blood pressure measurement, lung volume measurements, all, all kinds of different things that are really you know, like laser focused on their health. Finally, assuming that you have increased your iodine intake above the RDA, periodically test the full thyroid panel. If antibodies uh, present, reduce iodine intake and redo testing for factors that potentially cause Hashimoto's and fix them. But here's the, the bottom line. Do not limit your iodine intake because of a reversible underlying condition. Because iodine and thyroid are not synonymous. Okay. Iodine has many roles, as Dr. Campbell expressed and Dr. Carter expressed, beyond thyroid health. So we do not want to be limited. You know, um, I don't go on the highway and get behind someone going 30 miles an hour. I'll, open, I'll go past an individual. Um, I won't tell you what kind of car they're driving, but I know what it is. But anyway, that's a, that's a long story. So iodine is a crucial nutrient. Try to take in more iodine than is dictated by the presumed need of your thyroid and the potential for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so I'm going to guess that since I ran through that quite quickly, it'll be useful if I put that protocol out on our blog, which, um, which I will definitely do. So um, with that, Dr. Carr, any comments or questions on that? Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, Does anyone have questions? Dr. Carter can ask questions to, the, to us or say something to us that 
we he already knows that we don't know and we don't know how to ask the question. Uh, <laughs> Doris. Doris, you opened up Pandora's box there, my dear. Um, but but the point is, the point is women in particular, but men probably are are sort of have their blinders on to thyroid health. Women are very peaked on this topic. Um, it can be a, a big drain on your energy. So, but Hashimoto's may be just a warning signal of something underlying that's affecting your energy. So you you know you got a you know energy, pain, sleeplessness, all, all these all these different things. But so often people come to me and they're blaming their thyroid, but the thyroid looks really good. So we got to look elsewhere. But a lot of times the thyroid can be a major player in how you feel on a daily basis. Michael, does the thyroid affect cortisol levels at all? Well, I mean, that's the, the other thing. Oftentimes, um, adrenal dysfunction drives thyroid dysfunction because, you know, it's all part of that HPAT axis, you know, the hypothalamic pituitary, pituitary adrenal thyroid axis. So, um, in, mo in a lot of situations, just addressing thyroid dysfunction um, with, you know, medication, um, and well, especially medication um, and or, you know, supplementation uh, still is not addressing um, the root cause. And of course, you know, if it's Hashimoto's, just putting you on the medication or, or thiodine or whatever, still obviously is not addressing the root cause, uh, whether it be leaky gut or, you know, subacute infections or heavy metals or whatever. But most people um, overlook the, the key role that adrenal uh, health has when it comes to thyroid function. So optimizing that, well, testing for it to really see. And of course, the best way to do that is, um, you know, a 24 hour saliva uh, urine test, um, which gives you, um, you know, the cortisol levels um, on a circadian rhythm for, you know, four times in the morning, uh, lunchtime, afternoon, and at night, um, coupled with DHEA levels. So all of that uh, plays a significant role. Also, adrenal dysfunction plays a significant role in immune health because uh, high or low cortisol levels will affect um, your secretory IgA levels, which are the main immunoglobulin class in the gut, um, which of course can, uh, if you have low secretory IgA levels, which a lot of people have, <laughs> because most people have leaky gut, um, then that makes you more vulnerable to um, these infections uh, and parasites and so forth again, which drives the whole thyroid dysfunction as, uh, as a cause. So, so yeah, just uh, the body is very intricate and complicated. So just focusing on one body organ really doesn't um, uh, satisfy uh, in every instance, you know, what's, what's really going on. So, you know, someone commented that iodine is stored in breast tissue. And I think, you know, uh, Dr. Kern and I just published a book that will be available if anybody attends Jonathan Landsman's docuseries on cancer at the end of August and in, in September. And, you know, our whole thesis is that infection plays a whole huge role in chronic diseases and cancer is no exception. So in, in what I'm writing in this uh, Health Freedom Lost book, I explain how iodine does particularly get into the uh, lymphatic system within the breast and can um, really control infectious processes there. Um, so yes, thank you for that comment, Kay. And then someone says they have no Hashimoto's but plenty of thyroglobulin antibodies. Michael, what can cause that syndrome or is that a misinterpretation of a diagnosis? No, no, thyroglobulin antibodies are also key with Hashimoto's, but more importantly, high thyroglobulin antibodies are, can be associated with thyroid cancer. So definitely always, 
even with you know Hashimoto's with TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies elevated, it's a good idea to get an ultrasound of the thyroid. So have that assessed for nodules and so forth. But yeah, thyroglobulin antibodies can be either uh, Hashimoto's or indicative of thyroid cancer. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Yeah. Um, will you make your paper just shown available? Of course, Judy, but only to you. Just kidding. <laughs> put it out. I'm gonna put it out in the blog. Um, does it matter if you take iodine drops, kelp powder, or add seaweed to your diet? You know, the, the, the thing is iodine, it's all about oxidation and reduction. So it's very easy to, um, for iodine to take, you know, if you have iodide, that's the reduced version. So it undergoes redox very easily. So you can take an iodine in any fashion and your body will energetically convert it to the form it needs. You know, Ludol's, I believe, has both the potassium, the potassium iodide and also the iodine. Um, a lot of the supplements, like the iThyroid that I took, has, has both. What the kelp has, I'm not 100% sure if it has iodine in it, but it, it likely could because the plant can energetically um, um, oxidize the iodide to iodine. Um, so that, but the, the thing is, I mentioned at the very beginning before we started the reductionism, we look at one thing. But if I was going to take iodine, I would do seaweed as much as possible. So, for example, Sunday, I went to my favorite little uh, Thai Japanese restaurant. I got myself my sea a seaweed salad. And then Tuesday, I'm, I'll be getting a seaweed salad. I try to eat seaweed salad at least twice a week, as well as taking um, a small amount of iodine, but particularly on days of, of exercise. Can't you almost guess the blood value of your reverse T3 if you get the blood value of both your T3, total T3, and your free T3? No. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, Dr. Stark. I think that's a separate. Yeah, you have to test it directly. Yeah. Um, would there be a home urine test for iodine? Yes. Well, like, I mean, when you say home, no. I mean, that still has to come from the lab, but I mean, you know, you, I do the 24 hour urine test. So basically you have a canister that you bring home with you and then you collect urine for 24 hours. Will says, uh, are the iodine supplement amounts milligrams or micrograms? It's very important to pay attention to that. Um, MCG, <laughs> MCG micrograms, MG milligrams, okay? So if it's uh, one milligram, it's a thousand micrograms. One mg is a thousand mcg. And so you don't need a lot of iodine, but it's still very crucial. So somewhere in the one mg or a thousand mcg is kind of in the middle of, of optimal for most people, lower for people with Hashimoto's, higher for people that are very physically active. In, in my humble opinion. I missed that. What signals malabsorption? So there's no perfect thing. Um, the, the electrical system is driven by absorption of minerals. And the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, is how fast red blood cells settle. In some ways, it's a surrogate for the electrical system in your body because what keeps them apart or from not settling is an electric, electromagnetic field. So the ESR is a indicator of malabsorption. It's not perfect. And what I like to remind people of, since it's imperfect, does the ESR, the sed rate, collide with an optimal gut? No, it probably, when your sed rate is perfect, your guts could still be somewhat out of whack, maybe up to, up to by 25%, just, just picking a, a number out of, out of my hat. But, so in other words, everybody, even though the standard of care in some instances says your sed rate can be 40 millimeters in an hour, in my opinion, nobody should have an ESR greater than two, period, zero, not even, not even three. Okay, so there's a huge discrepancy between um, 
what we've determined, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, and what the standard of care publishes. The said rate of 40, you have sick blood. Your blood sticks together. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's unhealthy. You know, red blood cells, as, as Dr. Harshfield explained to us through the, um, the glycocheck program and whatnot, is that red blood cells never touch each other as they go through the vessels. They don't touch the, the endothelium, the glycocalyx, the, 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 the lining of the, of the um, vascular membranes, never touch it. So um, missed that with signal interesting on oral health and I- well, other, other things that signify malabsorption would be low total protein, globulin, um, and albumin levels. So those are key indicators of malabsorption. Yeah, and I think homocysteine is uh, malabsorption, can be malabsorption of, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I've seen people just go on probiotics and the homocysteine comes down. So I think they have a B vitamin absorption issue. And then any kind of iron thing, unless you have some sort of iron disease, which I think most people don't, they have, a, they have an absorption issue. Right. Um, we are not going to get to, um, we are not gonna get to metabolic stuff today because there are 38 messages interesting on oral health and iodine. I am just Ludols of water, 50 milligrams to 70 milligrams. So this is a very large amount, milligrams. This is at the upper end of the Brownstein and Jorge Fletcher level uh, at a time and swish the solution in my mouth because it feels right. You know, um, what would be symptoms, Dr. Carter, of excess iodine. I know that um, you can have severe flushing and things like that. But you, I'm, I'm but it, it, it can cause hyperthyroidism, definitely. So, you know, rapid heart rate. Um, and anybody okay. who's reading this, who doesn't have Hashimoto's, presumes perfect health, you don't just ramp up to 50 milligrams. Yeah, that's a huge dose. Yeah, if, you, if you've taken precious little in your life as a supplement and you're most likely living in America and not getting a lot of iodine, you're going to start with 150, you know, 150 micrograms initially, RDA, and then work your way up following that protocol, making sure that you're not in Hashimoto. So it's all about adaptation. Yeah. Um, so let's see, Susan, yeah, said plus low ferritin, yeah, and, and, and high homocysteine. Iodine helps prevent breast cancer, Dr. Bernard Eskin, researcher, yeah, no question. Yeah. Okay, I think you should also have folks measure their underarm body temperature first thing in the morning. Women should do this two or three days after flow starts. Um, Rhoda Barnes is a great book, Hypothyroidism, the Unexpected, Unsuspected Illness. It makes a lot of sense measuring yeah. temperature. Mm -hmm. I didn't put that in the protocol, and uh, guess what? I, I totally forgot about that. But yeah, that should that should definitely be something that people should do. Um, my understanding is you need to fix the adrenals before you can really fix the thyroid, along with, of course, ferreting out underlying causes of the thyroid dysfunction. Agreed, Dr. Stark. Um, Using an analog thermometer, wait 10 minutes, so we have some information there. Uh, there's old time doctors routinely gave iodine to patients presenting with fatigue, pain, exhaustion, overweight, and any number of mysterious symptoms, and most of them got better. It seems to me that the current drug lords trust that. A ab absolutely, um, and discourage armor even changing the formula. Any thoughts? Well, I think, I think the first thing is, um, is we need iodine and we don't, we need more than the RDA. So everybody should up their iodine, but we're giving you a cautious way to do this. We completely agree that iodine has multifactorial benefits in human physiology. But at the end of the day, everything is redox. Okay, I've explained this before. If you have a iron nail, you tend not to use that to put your picnic table together outside because it's gonna be rusty very quickly. So what you do is you put a galvanized nail on it instead and a zinc coated nail. 
Zinc oxidizes before the iron, it's sacrificial, it saves the iron, okay? Iodine is sacrificial, it's saving the body. But since it oxidizes so easily, iodine itself will, um, will be able to create reactive oxygen species that, that are probably the way that this thing is, um, iodine is destroying pathogens through redox. So we want everybody to get their iodine up. That's why we're talking about this. It's really, I think it's really, a, it's in our book under critical underappreciated nutrients, boron, cod liver oil, sulfur, iodine. Those are kind of the big ones. Um, the analog for moms are almost impossible to find. Have you found a source? Yeah, that's a problem. I don't really like those digital ones. Um, when children scrape their knees and mother would put iodine. Absolutely, I still do that. Uh, would that, that have been iodine? Or why'd that go away? It's still povidone or, or betadine, iodine. You can tell it's iodine, the element, diatomic element to iodine stuck together because it's an orangish brown gas that dissolves in water to give you a brown orangish liquid, 10% povidone. That's what I put into my hydroflosser to floss my teeth a couple of times a week. Whereas iodide, potassium iodide is a white crystal, looks no different than salt. Um, let's see. My TSH is always normal, yet my Broda, Batnus, armpit test, always low, 95. That sounds like, Martha, it sounds like, I think it's, that sounds like a, a Dr. Carter. Yeah, you, but you can't just go with the TSH. You have no idea what the free T3 and free T4 levels and antibody yeah. levels are. And, and once again, if you're looking at lab for 2.5 is completely normal, but I've had people with both antibodies quite elevated at that, that level. Not a lot, but how about nascent charged iodine? You know, I, I look at it as a raw material. You get iodine in your body. You know, one of the most energetic processes in your entire body is called active transport. It's simply pushing things in and out of cells. So if your body needs to do something, it will expend energy to do that. So if it needs to take iodide and convert it to iodine to affect something in your body, it will. Um, giving it both versions seems to make a lot of sense, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that I know all the microbiology of, uh, and chemistry of iodine in all aspects of metabolism. But if we had to think about like active transports, the sodium potassium pump, they're going at certain ratios in and out of cells to drive things into cells. If we had to eat foods to get the exact amount of sodium in our body and the exact amount of potassium, we would spend our entire life trying to figure out what to eat and how much. So, you know, our job is, you know, we have the kidney, the liver, all these spleen, whatever we have uh, that's filtering and partitioning things. So our job is just to eat high nutrient density and let our body does uh, the rest. How does iodine relate to boron? It relates to boron, Doris, in that I might've used it in the same sentence. That's <laughs> Good um, answer. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, you know, there, there's never, once again, there's never anything in, in, in isolation. Um, but boron plays a role in um, calcium homeostasis, and that's a whole that's a whole other that's a whole other topic. I was using that as an example of how we can't just say we take in calcium and, and our bones are going to be healthy or our tooth and nails going to be healthy. There are always you for explaining. going to be cofactors, and, and I believe iodine. I read something, and I think I have it in my book, or I published it somewhere else. Is that the Japanese absorb nutrients out of seafood better than most other cultures because they have a high seafood diet. And so they're getting a, probably a lot of cofactors that, that work together. What those are, you know, uh, 
Dr. Harshfield can wax elegantly on to Croydon and a lot of the other things that come out of the sea. Um, I like Terry naturally, has three forms. Um, seaweed is potentially contaminated like most food and we have no idea. That so yeah, Howie, I, I, I is a concern about that. But we always have to look at risk benefit. Your glycocalyx is an extremely important thing, supported by seaweed, phacoidin, iodine, all these things. So, you know, we do have detoxification pathways. So, and the dose makes the toxicity. So I, I look at nature as, as generally healthy. Um, and then we should do detoxifications regularly, but don't avoid a nutrient from a natural source because you'll almost never duplicate those cofactors in a, in a supplement. You know, food-based supplements obviously may have that, but um, they're still processed, maybe thermally uh, treated. We don't know, um, versus, the, versus the natural thing. Like I'm getting some umibudo, so sea grapes, but it's in high salt or it's dehydrated. What have I lost in that process? that I would normally get from the live active uh, sea grape. So just some considerations. ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. I love seaweed salad, but stop eating it because food coloring was added. I hate that when they put the yellow coloration in it. You know, I, I don't know, but I have one restaurant that certifies no additives, no food coloring. And I will be there Tuesday evening. Um, wow, there's 43 more. <laughs> time for time for Dr. Harshfield to come in and say something. Um, yeah, the interest is, uh, and, and Dr. Carter was talking about a second ago, Thomas, is that <clears throat> where I really got interested in this uh, iodine, thyroid, adrenal gland axis, and so forth was in trauma patients. And we think about people that thump their head and it it bangs your brain. You get, get traumatic brain injury. The pituitary gland lives in a small little space called the cella tersica, the Turkish saddle. And you can thump your pituitary gland. And these people after head trauma, several months down the road, it's kind of interesting, the timing. It's almost like the mRNA stuff, you know, several months afterward, and then we had to deal with it. They were having thyroid issues. And so we started looking into that. And it turns out just exactly what Dr. Carter was talking about. The adrenal gland is the key to the hypothalamus, which is really the master gland. I mean, in my opinion, it's below the thalamic nuclei and it talks to the pituitary gland. And it says, hey, we want some thyroid. We don't, we don't see enough iodine here. And if you don't have iodine, uh, Dr. Lewis, to your point, that's how you make stomach acid. I mean, you can't, this is just such a tight little circle here. You can't absorb anything. And so these people have trauma. They concuss their pituitary gland. The brain trauma is easy to see. These people can't think straight. I mean, it's easy to test their eye movement and so forth. The pituitary thing, we just need to think about it day one and start looking at their endocrine system because when that gets fouled up, it's like a bucket full of coat hangers. You let that go a year, it is so hard to unravel that. But the pituitary gets thumped. The adrenal gland is fired up because you just got in a car wreck. And it's talking in hypothalamus saying, hey, yeah, we, we got to repair some stuff. It sends down that infundibulum to the pituitary and said, hey, thyrotropic releasing hormone. Pituitary releases thyrotropic stimulating hormone to the thyroid. And if the axis is intact and you have iodine, you start to make thyroid hormone. And like you, we talked about, the key element, iodine is to the thyroid what boron is to the parathyroid. I mean, those are the parent molecules that make each of those endocrine glands work. Uh, Parathormone, obviously, is calcium, but this has to do with energy production. What is really interesting is that T4, it's got four little struts on it. Ideally, they should all have iodine molecules. Problem is the goitrogens, the things that give us an abnormal thyroid function, fluoride, bromine, things get stick onto the thyroid struts and knock the iodine off. And now you're 
T4 looks normal, but it's not. It doesn't have iodine. And so let's say it does have iodine. It gets converted to T3. Hey, that's great. T3 goes to the membrane. And as Dr. Lewis was talking about, boy, that is the key. That's how you control what's in the cell with what's outside the cell. You have got to have T3, active T3 to do it. But then there's another component, a T2, that goes into the cell and works on the mitochondria. That's energy. Without T2 conversion, your mitochondria don't produce the correct amount of energy. Um, again, this is kind of a long way around. I'll land this plane here in a second. Um, looking at trauma gives us an acute look at something that generally we have to, we see 20 years of issues with iodine metabolism before the patient actually comes to us. And we ultrasound their thyroid to Dr. Lewis's point. We see a number of things. If we see these cyst colloid collections, they're benign, but they're like reservoirs of thyroglobulin. Why the heck is your thyroid storing thyroid hormone? But, but so we keep an eye on these colloid cysts. They're, they're, they're fluid looking on ultrasound with a dot, one little calcification dot. They're very classic, totally benign. Then we start to look at the thyroid as an adenoma, like in the breast, fibroadenoma. It's not cancer, but it's what's going on there. So we see all these nodules in the thyroid gland. Oh my gosh, we start doing biopsies. Um, and what we've got to do is stop doing all these unnecessary biopsies like we did with breast cancer. Um, so the spectrum is that you got so many physicians, radiologists, ultrasound and these things, family practice doctors going, ma'am, I'll weigh 300 pounds and can't lose weight. And so in endocrinology, all these silos have to talk. That's why this is so important to have this kind of conference with these folks on this call. It's a citizen scientist going, hey, I tried that. It didn't work. Let's talk about our failures because that's how we learn. So when we do what we're told, the recommended daily allowance, we do all that stuff that we're told to do, it didn't work. Let's talk about it. That's this forum. My perspective is kind of off axis, but all of us have been in head trauma and so forth. And it can produce endocrine problems totally different than thumping your brain. And so that's what I look for. And since I've joined this group and now understand how to call Dr. Carter and say, this patient needs this lab, that helps me to treat the whole entire, not just their brain injury part, but the pituitary, which to me is the master system. You know, the immune system is important, but that endocrine system first, immune next. I'm injecting someone's knee because their cruciate ligament's torn. If we don't balance those things, what we call prehab, none of my stem cell injections on the knee are going to work. And that means be cognizant. If you've had head trauma, it can be an endocrine issue as much as a mentation issue. Um, and then how all this works is really interesting. Thomas, we need to do a cartoon. Wouldn't it be great to have the little molecules? You're a cartoon. <laughs> well, besides me. Okay. So, I'm sorry. That's, that's I said we, want. not you, not you. We. <laughs> that, that's more than you want to hear. But anyway, that, that was sort of my, how I got into this. It's like uh, physicians. You can piddle around out in the field in your little specialty, but you're going to come home eventually. You're going to have to understand the endocrine system and the gut. That you just absolutely have to. And then go back out and do your magical surgeries and, and stem cell injections. But until you fix this, what we call prehab, that stuff isn't going to work as well. Oh, time, time. That's it. Uh, that was a beautiful <laughs> time. So <laughs> anyway, the question, there's a question about nascent iodine. But the other question was about wound healing, about putting iodine on the skin and then following it with MSM, you know, sulfur. But I think you, your sulfur should be internal. And the reason why you're putting iodine externally is because that's where the bacteria is getting on your skin. You know, there's an interesting study from the Civil War. And uh, Dr. Harshi, I'll pick on you. You know what prevented uh, a lot of these wounds from becoming infected? Civil War. That was before autologous blood. They learned about that in World War I. You just drag some blood out, shake it up, and put it back in that person. It will heal that wound. In peroxide, we got to be careful with that stuff. It kills the bad guys, but it kills, it stops healing. That's it why this hypochlor is so, so, so much. No question, but it was uh, flies. Um, Larva, yes. 
fly larvae suck mm -hmm. up the bacteria. <laughs> so, um, you know, next time you have a wound, you can use DMSO, you can use iodine. If you really want to sting, but it'll work well, is concentrated salt solution. Or you can just, you know, hang out with some flies and they'll take care of you. Or hypochlor. So, just spray some hypochlor. Any hypochlor is the way to, way to mm -hmm. do it. Um, so um, is there any test uh, to test iodine levels? Should we supplement daily? And the optimal ranges are, is toxicity possible? Kofi, I'll, I'll put that all out on my blog. You can read through my protocol. Yeah, the, the, the urine, the 24-hour urine test is, is the, the best one to get a really good idea of what's, what's going on. Serum is not as, as uh, accurate but it could still be a, a good start, right? But generally urinary, 24 hour urine is the best test. And I like Beverly's question. I've been on thyroid for over 30 years. Is there any way a person can get off armor thyroid? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the answer is you gotta start, you gotta test to start with. Yeah, you know, and I, again, I, find out what the driving cause is. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's the problem with traditional doctors is, even, even when you go to an endocrinologist and they actually go as far as testing your antibodies, they still put you on the same medication. <laughs> they don't tell you oh. why you have these antibodies. They just put you on the medication and it's like, and most of them after, after that initial, you know, uh, level, most don't even follow it because that's not going to, it's not going to change anything that they do, you know, because none of them get at the root cause of why you have hypothyroidism because their main goal is just to put you on medication rather than assessing, do you have leaky gut? Do you have subacute infections? Do you have heavy metals? No traditional doctor. You know, and, and if you're on a, a thyroid medication and you still have a thyroid, then you want to be in a normal TSH range because you don't want your thyroid to be shut down. So I see a lot of people that are hyperthyroid, but they're not really hyperthyroid. They're just taking too much thyroid medication. They're taking too, too much T4 or T4 and T3. So their brain, the brain hypothalamus says, I don't have, I don't have to send any signal to the thyroid. So the thyroid goes to sleep. Now I'm sure it can be woken up, but yeah. the point is if you want to get off thyroid medication, you need to make sure your thyroid is functioning. Number one, you have a thyroid. And then it's a, like, like anything in, in chronic, it's a slow titration process, which is going to require time and time and money. Unfortunately, you got to be testing. You've got to be documenting your symptoms, all these, all these different things as you go through the process. But I mean, my classic example is I had this gentleman and Doris says, has nothing to do with thyroid, just, you know, but it's just sort of an exercise and understanding. And so this gentleman was on high doses of insulin and all this stuff. And, and, he, and he, you know, he got put on the statin drug for cholesterol, the blood pressure medication and um, the insulin and all that. And the first time I met with him, he said, they slapped me on blood pressure medication, but I didn't even have high blood pressure. <laughs> so that, is, that happens. That happens. So I tell people with blood pressure, measure your blood pressure twice a day. And then we can slowly get you off your blood pressure medication. And with the thyroid, it's not quite that simple. But, you know, do this whole panel that we talked about, and you may be able to slowly and monitor your symptoms. Temperature might be a good one at home to do to see how you're, how you're regulating. But a lot of people are on medications because of a white coat syndrome or you know, we all have, you know, look at, just look at glucose or blood pressure things that we have spikes in our health on a minute by minute, hour by hour and day by day thing. When did the measurement occur? What did you show up in the doctor's office and you just had a little acute thing going on and, and then they do this measurement and they misinterpret it. So, you know, if your, your entire medical, you know, portfolio is being based on and everything you're doing is based on one measurement, Mm, EGADs, you know, that's, um, that's why, you know, testing is, is ultimately the best thing to do. But, you know, Kofi, um, 
you know, going back to the iodine is if you're not Hashimoto's, if you don't have highly elevated um, antibodies, if you're not hypo or hypo hyperthyroid, then um, right at the outset, then you probably want to increase your iodine, but you don't go up in big leaps, you go up in steps. And yes, you can take it daily because it washes out relatively quickly. It's not so much of a fat soluble nutrient like vitamin D that can hang out now. Um, our guy on MedCram did one case on vitamin D toxicity. And it's, it's, it's an absurd case that almost will never happen in our population. But I watched it anyway because there were some interesting things to get out of it because the vitamin D level was ridiculously high. A number of other things going on. And four months later, it was still ridiculously high and he hadn't taken vitamin D. So there's a big difference between fat soluble and water soluble nutrients in terms of their half life, how long they stay in the body. But I would suggest that at a minimum, you probably want to be making sure you're getting some level of iodine at least every other day. <laughs> Yeah. How's it going, guys? Anyway, so that is uh, that is the story for today. We managed to, to uh, spend the whole hour and never got to. Um, so we're just waiting on Eric, right? Metabolic stuff. So we'll go with uh, we'll go with the metabolic stuff um, next week, unless Jody has something else in, lined up from a guest speaker perspective. Hey, Thomas, can I ask you one thing? Absolutely, okay. David. We, you, you, didn't, you didn't close yet. You, spoke, there, but you didn't close, so we I will, I, I, I'm, I'm closing. This is the natural thing. Is, is there a website where I can order larvae and leeches? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're going back to. I mean, seriously, people give blood. It makes you healthier to get rid of your old blood. Give blood. So leeches, there we go. And larvae, if you got a little hole in your spacesuit, put some flies on there. Or you can do this. Go to Louisiana, wait around those swamps down there. You'll get everything you need. There you go. I love it. I'm going to give blood in October. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. So, so uh, Dr. Laird, you know, his ferritin wasn't even really high, but it was a little bit elevated in terms of what we want for an optimal normal. And he gave blood and he said, he immediately felt fantastic, much mm -hmm. better. So um, at some point, we'll have Dr. Laird on again because he has some other interesting topics of him talking about um, GMOs. But I think sharing his experience on giving blood would be very instructive because we all need a little motivation for myself. So with that, everybody have a great, um, great day. And then tomorrow night, Jody will most likely run the the video the zoom but we're going to have a q a so if you have questions lingering from this iodine conversation um bring that and bring any other question you have tomorrow night at eight so we don't have a formal follow-on to this program per se and i'm not going to be in attendance maybe i might join at 8 30 or something of that nature so but uh joining at 8 30 will interfere with me purchasing my cd salad so i may not and with that, uh, everybody, have a great day. Have a great rest of the week. I don't see you on tomorrow. Take care. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.